Hi, welcome to Reality Check. My guest today is Mike Roshan. Uh, Mike is CTO of oil and gas industry for EPAM. So Mike, welcome to the channel and I uh, would love to hear your story. So what brought you uh, to this point in life? <laughs> Great question, hey Ilya, nice to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike, uh, almost more uh, than 20 years experience in AI. So I started to study AI as a master student in the Technical University of Dresden. I was lucky to be part of the industrial track, meaning that I got a position um, uh, at Siemens uh, Corporate Technology, where I was a research scientist and made kind of, you know, my career through the path of AI and everything what is related to it. I did my PhD. Uh, PhD was mainly about uh, the topic of knowledge graph. You may know about this topic yeah, and how it can help in general for any type of application of AI uh, with a focus on different industries. Like we are in Germany, right? So we are talking mainly about automotive. We are talking about power generation utilities. But also later on, I uh, started to talk about oil and gas as one of the main industries in the world at that time. And I was again lucky again, yeah, thanks to uh, the crisis of 2008, economical crisis, uh, AI became to be a, not anymore a kind of, you know, a theoretical thing, but also something practical, which was related to the way how you can improve uh, reliability, availability of your assets and to do it with more efficiency from OPEX and CAPEX perspective, right? So that was kind of, you know, one of the very first steps actually yeah, of practical implementation of AI, more from a business perspective. Awesome. As you are a pioneer of AI and the industrial world, um, I have uh, a question to you. So what do you think about uh, generative AI, the current um, incarnation of AI? So is it a hype or is it something real? How does the uh, oil and gas industry respond to the ideas of Gen AI? Yeah, a very good question. Uh, I still uh, ask this question to myself as well, right? So I don't have a precise answer. Uh, what is this exactly? Yeah, but let me just explain you my story. Yeah, how I see specifically the progress of different directions of AI that we can uh, observe right now. So just imagine, yeah, uh, back to when I started actually, yeah, to do with AI, and one of the uh, directions that I can see that was related to the way how you can recognize different um, ways to speak English, right? You can speak English being uh, uh, someone from Eastern Europe, for instance, yeah. You can speak English being someone living in Germany and so on and so forth. And you can imagine, yeah, still we are talking about different ways of pronouncing things, yeah. And can you train AI or model or a system uh, which is based on AI? Uh, uh, and uh, differentiate those backgrounds of people who speak English, right? So that was a kind of, you know, question. It took me around like two years actually, yeah, to build such type of uh, acoustic model uh, with all applications of different statistical methods, neural networks, uh, hidden Markov models, and so on and so forth. The next step was deep learning. You may remember it back to 2015, 16. And I had a similar task, yeah? Even if it sounds different, it was related to the way how you can analyze vibrations, right? Just imagine uh, you have uh, uh, great acoustic sensors again, right? But you deal not anymore with the language, with the way how we speak, but we deal with the kind of, you know, sounds and noises uh, from industrial perspective, yeah? And just imagine just to build a very first model as a kind of, you know, proof of value, proof of concept, uh, took me just two weeks. With generative AI, uh, the path can be even shorter. Right. Why? Because AI in general is not about the way how you provide decisions. It's more about two things. It's about learning, right? How you can train your things much faster, extracting knowledge. And the second, it's about automation. Yeah. So generative AI is a new level of both learning plus automation. And if we consider generative AI as a part of AI, that's correct. If we consider it as a next era of AI and AI development, that's absolutely correct. Is it about AGI, so artificial generic intelligence? That's a question, yeah? I do see some good signs that it might be AGI or a form of AGI uh, in the future. But once again, for me, it's 
both. It's learning, it's about automation, and both things in terms of the progress that we've seen uh, in, uh, inside of generative AI is definitely there, definitely in place. I like how you uh, view uh, AI as the technology development rather than, oh my God, uh, everything, uh, we are obsolete as humans. Um, everybody, everyone will be replaced with uh, AI. Uh, let's stay with the practical um, track uh, today. I'm talking about this. So how do you see your customers and oil and gas? And oil and gas, probably not the most um, cutting edge, technologically advanced um, uh, companies. So how do they, or maybe I I'm, I'm just um, don't understand them well, but how, how, what's their view on uh, the advancements that AI is bringing them with the current generation? Um, it's great that you mentioned actually, yeah, the, you know, uh, the people, how they speculate, yeah, about uh, the way how AI can replace them, right? Or replace jobs, yeah? You know, uh, just, you know, as a kind of, you know, side story, because we both of us, uh, we are in Germany, right? Yeah. And I do remember like 10 years ago, I went to one of the uh, automotive manufacturers here in Germany, in B uh, Bavaria. Uh, uh, you may guess uh, to whom I went. And uh, we didn't talk about uh, AI itself, right? We were talking about the way how things were automated. And like in 60s, they produced 200,000 cars <clears throat> with 20,000 people. And 10 years ago, the same level of production, uh, uh, but only with 200 people, like 100 times less. And then the motto of a new CEO at that time, 10 years ago, once again, yeah, that AI can help to reduce this number by 10 means from 200 to 20, right? Sounds as a good uh, objective. At the same time, at the same time, the people who were working on this, they were IT people, right? So like software developers, right? Like all people from data analytics perspective, yeah? Nowadays, we are talking about AI and data scientists, yeah? Uh, uh, experts, yeah? And so on and so forth. We are simply changing, you know, the modality of those people and profiles. But at the same time, more or less, we remain with the same volume or with the same number of people, actually, yeah? who is in charge or involved in the process of certain production. Coming back to your original question of oil and gas. So you are, you are right, yeah? So oil and gas per se is very conservative, right? Uh, oil and gas is about oil production, gas production, yeah? Uh, uh, at the same time, technologically, uh, the industry itself is one of the very well developed. And specifically, if you consider some very good examples on the market, yeah, you go to the uh, biggest players, like you take top five players in oil and gas industry, uh, either European or US or uh, Middle East players, and you will see how much they invest into AI. And the major drivers for those uh, started like, you know, uh, as I already explained to you, like back to 2008 economical crisis and people or this industry, they didn't want to invest into new assets, right? So, uh, so they wanted to redo their CapEx projects and at the same time still be conservative with OPEX. And what happened actually, yeah, it means that, you know, your equipment, your critical equipment uh, uh, goes to be older and older. It requires much more maintenance, right? And you have to balance somehow whether you invest into something new or you still keep your uh, remaining useful lifetime on a certain level and consider your old assets or old critical equipments uh, still at the same efficiency levels as it should be, right? And exactly the second direction uh, uh, was chosen and specifically AI could help a lot. Why AI? Because people like, you know, experts who know uh, uh, this critical equipment, uh, they're still constrained or limited in terms of their capacity to provide services. So there should be an analog, yeah? what we call nowadays kind of digital twin, or you may name it differently, right? Uh, which can be uh, built on top of either AI or physics-based models or something else, right? And that was exactly the tendency starting in 2008. So one of the topics, yeah, it's about predictive uh, maintenance. It's about reliability. Another topic, it's about production optimization. And uh, you know, Ilya, uh, that optimization as a mathematical problem, yeah, has different angles. And, you know, it's just poor math, yeah? Simply how we can provide a kind of, you know, global optimum or local optimum, yeah? Can we consider optimization from an energy perspective? Can we consider it from sustainability perspective or poor financial, net profit value, right? 
So those things, how you balance them, yeah, that can be a question to AI and AI can help a lot. And once again, yeah, you remember what I mentioned, yeah, AI is always about learning. So it can find certain patterns that were unknown to people and it can do it really much faster than people. And second, it's about automation. So how can we come to this optimization task and solve it uh, much faster in comparison to our planning departments? Can we do it instead of two months, just within two weeks? Is it possible or not? And that was exactly the role of AI, so production optimization. The third direction, supply chain management, right? Huge uh, supply chains, yeah? Uh, uncertainty, uh, different risks related to global politics, yeah? Uh, wars and so on, uh, so on and so forth, right? So those things should be considered where we deal with logistics, with inventory levels, uh, with stocks. How can we do it in the most efficient way? AI can be an answer. Hopefully it makes sense. Yes, it does. And actually, when you were talking about the fact that uh, we are dealing with the older equipment and uh, the amount of people that actually know how this older uh, aging equipment works is getting smaller and smaller. People get retired and um, it's very difficult to find people that understand how it works. So I was talking to some of my customers in the past and they were uh, talking about knowledge transfer. Is that one of the use cases that you also see in the oil and gas uh, industry where you basically take the knowledge of uh, the experienced guys and make the digital support person or support model that will support the aging equipment? Is that absolutely, one? absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm so a bunch of times actually, yeah, the situation where uh, the experts were already at certain age and uh, there were no newcomers. Like, you know, this problem of Generation Z, right? Yeah. So there are not so many human resources that can substitute a certain uh, uh, level of expertise, right? And this is a real huge problem, actually. Yeah? And AI definitely can play a role. Is it sufficient? Not at all. Yeah. So from my perspective, if I go one level higher, and we don't consider just technology, but we also consider uh, our social a structure, right? Uh, how it should be balanced with the technology, yeah? Then definitely we need to invest also into education of people, right? So just AI itself is not enough. It's not an answer, right? And we need to balance those, yeah? Uh, unfortunately, right now we do get the development of AI, but from an educational perspective, I do see a lot of gaps in comparison to what was in Germany like 30 years ago. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with you. This is the very, very big thing and um, taking edu um, bet on education of people uh, is very important component um, because one of my past speakers, he was talking about the fact that Gen AI will elevate people and the level from which you will be elevated depends on your education. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think in order to be a really... Um, how, how to say it, uh, in order to be really a good companion for AI, you have to be educated yourself. Absolutely. And that's where the benefits will be uh, maximized. Fully agree with this. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, you talk about three uh, use cases so far. Uh, which one uh, do your customers would put num as number one? Which one they will prioritize today? Um, in terms of the use of uh, AI and oil and gas field? Uh, I'm lucky one, right? And uh, so all of them, they will be considered as the most critical and important, yeah? So there is no ranking among those. All of them uh, um, tailored with a huge business value if you can solve part of it. Just to give you a sense in terms of numbers, right? Like production optimization, yeah? Can bring uh, uh, millions in terms of uh, efficiency, yeah? Uh, to the end customer annually, right? It's just about production optimization, yeah? If you deal with predictive maintenance, oh, I don't like the word in predictive maintenance, I prefer reliability, right? So we are talking about availability of your assets at the end, right? And if you consider a downtime, yeah? And reduction of this downtime, unplanned downtime specifically, yeah? So again, we are talking about millions, yeah? Tens of millions per asset, just, just imagine, per plant, yeah? So once again, we are really dealing with big numbers, yeah, and that is why, from a value perspective, those three use cases are at the top of each 
CEO, chief digital officer as well, or CIO program? Well, when I was talking to the customers, I saw that uh, specifically Gen AI, not predictive maintenance, um, like the older generation of uh, AI, but more of uh, generative AI, it's uh, on, the, on the list, but not yet budgeted. So do you see that the budgets are already there or you expect them to be available next year uh, for the use of Gen AI uh, in the oil and gas field? I think a generative AI will be never on the budget uh, of uh, oil and gas companies directly, mm -hmm. just because it must be connected to a business value, right? Sure. Yeah. If it is part of the business value of the bigger stack, which might uh, involve also other elements, right? So generative AI is just one of the elements, yeah? It's not a solution, right? It's just, you know, one of the screws actually, yeah? That must be there or should be there, should be in place uh, just to become much more efficient. But once again, just one of the elements, right? That is why I really prefer to talk about different use cases and what the role of generative AI might be in those use cases. Just let's be more specific. Let's take uh, production optimization, huge task, yeah? And we are specifically talking about upstream. So those companies that uh, do produce oil on gas, yeah? And those topics are already well known, yeah? So uh, the industry itself is not new uh, anymore, yeah? But just imagine in terms of the planning, of your uh, uh, production facilities, yeah? You need to consider reservoir. You need to consider your well from where your oil comes from, right? You need to consider lifting systems, yeah? So artificial lift systems, yeah? Pumps, you need to know with them, yeah? You need to talk about network, yeah? So networking, yeah, in terms of your pipes, yeah? And all infrastructure that should pump your oil somewhere to the end consumers, right? Like refineries, yeah? Or chemical plants, yeah? All those things are not trivial at all. What is the role of AI in general, right? It's about integration, just considering all those elements and considering them together, unifying certain data levels, yeah, and providing support in terms of decision-making. That's the role of AI. What about generative AI? Generative AI can deal much better with uh, uh, bad quality data, and data is always bad quality. There are different ways, actually, yeah, to reconsider or uh, to reconsider simple math, let's say, yeah, uh, to deal with bad data. But still, it will involves a lot of a lot of manual work that can be replaced with the help of generative AI approach, yeah, where generative AI is intelligent enough in order to see how to manipulate the data in order to uh, that it becomes better quality. That's one of the aspects. Another aspect is related to the way how we can reconsider the information from the past. So certain patterns that were not really known in the past in order to solve certain issues on the asset that appear on a daily basis, right? So that's kind of, you know, just two good examples, I think, for generative AI and its role in the whole production optimization process. But once again, it's just one of the elements, yeah? It's not the full picture. Yeah, I mm -hmm. understand. Thank you. Uh, my next question to you is, uh, have you seen the actual deployment uh, of uh, uh, AI, successful deployment stories of AI in oil and gas? And what are they? Absolutely. Uh, one very good example, I think. And I was really lucky, actually, yeah, to work with uh, one of the big, uh, yeah, it's a British, Dutch, uh, American company. Uh, you, you may guess which. Uh, and it was really... Uh, application of AI at scale, at enterprise scale. So not just, you know, one of the solutions, let's say, yeah, to solve a small problem. No, it was really at scale uh, for those three use cases. And this company, they have a dedicated uh, website uh, that you can visit and you can see real applications, real results and what's happening there. And I was always like, you know, in all my three companies, actually part of the story, a uh, really lucky one. And uh, I really just suggest everyone just to Google and to find this uh, company and the website, what I'm referring to. It's really worth of doing this. Uh, can mm -hmm. you share the name of the company so people- Yeah, I think it's, uh, it shouldn't be a secret yeah, or advertisement. Yeah, it's Shell, definitely, yeah. And uh, if everyone goes to shell.ai, can see really great uh, examples uh, of this program. And it's once again, we are talking about enterprise scale, so not kind of, you know, uh, one-term solution or POC or pilot. No, we're talking about 
at enterprise scale those things that are already deployed and successfully working, providing the value uh, to uh, their assets, yeah, plants, assets, and so on. Uh, I'm curious uh, um, about your perspective on that. So if you would give an advice for a startup, uh, that um, wants to penetrate the uh, oil and gas industry. What areas they should focus on to really get the attention of oil and gas uh, customers? Uh, one of the things which is less developed, and I do think, I do believe uh, that it must be better developed, mm, that's a combination of uh, physics-based models and AI in general, right? So physics-based model, once again, it's something what we call digital twin, but I personally believe that digital twin as a terminology is much uh, broader or should be much broader, much bigger, right? So it should involve also data science and AI uh, models as well. But once again, the classical definition of digital twin is about physics-based models. And uh, there are not so many examples yet of combination of both, yeah? Where you have a kind of, you know, hybrid approach either for production optimization or process optimization, if we are specifically talking about like refineries or chemical plants yeah, or LNG plants, right? Uh, or or uh, mm, uh, from supply chain perspective, right? Where, you know, digital twins for supply chains are very well known, already existing on the market, yeah? And how AI in combination with those can play a significant role, yeah? So this domain definitely requires much more attention and hopefully We'll have many more companies, startups, or companies in general, uh, just playing the role here. Cool, very cool. You, you know, um, this digital twin story. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is this is much bigger than uh, people think uh, about that typically. Some people think about uh, 3D models. Some people think about physical models. Some people think um, about the data sets. Uh, in fact, it should be all of the above plus the um, analytical models plus the generative models. So uh, this is uh, a model that you should be able to ask questions to. Uh, and questions like, what will happen if? Uh, that type of question. Or um, yes. yeah, how does this work? That's also the very valid question to this model. It's always about scenario analysis. So kind of what if scenario analysis, right? And the system should be capable actually uh, getting different uh, you know, options in getting those scenarios, right? And this is what is today not yet really available, yeah? Or available in kind of, you know, very constrained uh, domain or world, which is not sufficient uh, to solve bigger uh, problems we are talking about. Absolutely. Uh, I'm curious. Um, there, was a, uh, there is a very successful project called DARPA. Uh, that I'm sure you know about. Um, I wonder if there is something similar to that in the oil and gas industry. Uh, if not, it would be interesting to have some type of challenges. So who will build uh, the digital twin of the um, uh, oil well um, and uh, let the competition run and uh, startups submit their proposals and models um, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, so first of all, there are comparable comparable uh, initiatives, right? So it's not just a project, it's an initiative, I would say. One of them is uh, related to subsurface data. Uh, it's called OSU. So it's a huge consortium of different companies, oil and gas companies on the market. And they try to deal with a uh, way how the uh, data specifically um, um, everything what happens actually under the earth level, let's say, right, uh, can be dealt much more efficiently and professionally, yeah? From starting from, you know, data storage, data processing, data analysis, and so on and so forth, just, you know, providing those different scenarios, yeah? That's one of the things. Uh, the second, uh, that uh, big uh, um, uh, oil and gas service companies like SLB, Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, yeah, they do uh, a lot actually in terms of digital twins, uh, specifically for like production optimization or process optimization, right? So uh, the software, what you have already on the market, uh, it's really great, yeah? The only thing which is still sometimes missing, yeah, the element of AI, yeah? Because AI can provide bigger value 
from a digital twin perspective, just, you know, for instance, working much better with uncertain data or working much better for, you know, from a real-time perspective, right? Or providing uh, just, you know, integration of several elements, as I already mentioned, like, you know, you have a reservoir digital twin, you have well digital twin, yeah? Can be combined both those, yeah? Can we unify those yeah, actually as one ecosystem? Because right now it's a separate, yeah? So those things can be done much, much uh, better with the application of AI. And this is not always the case yet. And this is exactly where I work, right? The direction uh, and uh, many, many companies uh, similar to EPAM, uh, they do provide services specifically in this area, but it's not yet completed story. Yeah, So it will require some years from now, yeah? Just to make it perfect as I want, yeah? As me personally uh, wants. Yeah. You know, um, as the AI is developing so fast these days that I don't believe that any big company like Schlumberger or any anybody else uh, or a consortium of the companies can move fast enough to quickly come up with the new ideas and new solutions. So from my perspective, the missing component uh, uh, that DARPA does have is the open competition that opens the doors for like hundreds of startups that will start thinking about this and will be much faster than any corporate structure will ever be. So um, I think it might be interesting to have uh, this type of op open competitions in, in different areas, especially these days. Uh, you know, uh, just a, a, again, as a side comment, I just recently read a book. Uh, it's called Super Brain uh, of Pentagon or something uh, similar, right? Mm -hmm. And it was exactly the story about DARPA and how it was developed actually, yeah, back to 40s, uh, right? And I, I do believe sometimes, hopefully yeah, in 10, 20 years, we'll see something similar from oil and gas perspective as well, sure. I, hope, I, I certainly hope it will happen faster. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your, uh, what are your thoughts about the future of AI in oil and gas specifically? So how do you think um, uh, oil and gas will transform um, with the advancement in um, AI? Uh, the main driver as of today uh, for AI application is about efficiency, right? So we are really lucky that uh, the world plays a lot of a lot of attention uh, to sustainability topics, right? Uh, we do know uh, uh, the consequences if we just produce anything, right? Without taking care uh, about our society about our CO2 uh, emissions uh, or uh, uh, different type of emissions in general, right? Uh, energy efficiency, yeah. So those topics are really biggest drivers right now for application of AI. Why? Because, you know, kind of, you know, uh, very simple math doesn't really help to find this optimum as we discussed with you uh, some minutes ago, yeah. Uh, and here you need something more complex, yeah. And this is definitely AI that helps you really just, you know, to provide those uh, better optimums, uh, either in upstream industry or midstream, like LNG plants, or downstream, like refineries, right? And this is exactly AI, and this is exactly the role of AI. And frankly speaking, it will take some years, actually, yeah, that we come come up with most ideal solutions that can uh, deal really with the most efficient ways to produce uh, either oil or uh, um, uh, gasoline. Uh, right, but still, it's not yet there, and this is the place of AI. Yeah, that that's per that's perfect. So, um, production optimization is uh, clearly top of the mind uh, for oil and gas companies. Uh, at the same time, uh, you mentioned uh, regulate reg regulations and compliance, and uh, this is also probably a big topic for them. And uh, I believe that Gen AI can significantly help them. Uh, because I'm sure there are like a lot of people that work for these companies that just their job is to understand the uh, compliance requirements Absolutely. and uh, write the documents. And I think all these jobs uh, can be uh, hugely benefited from generative AI Absolutely. to um, understand the regulations and write the compliance documentation. And how to execute those, right? Yeah, because that, that's, that, that's a question. very good yeah. point. Yes. One yeah. of the things just, and you know, we are in software world, right? And you can write really the best specification, what you would like to achieve. But at the end, it's always a question how you can execute those things. Yeah. And exactly the role of generative AI is not just to provide a summary 
as a kind of you know technical documentation, but the way how you can execute those things into reality, right? And that's exactly uh, the path actually what I see all the piece uh, um, uh, of this overall uh, uh, stack. What I see where AI can play a significant role. Yes. Excellent. Uh, so I really appreciate your thoughts and your experience on the use of AI in oil and gas field. Now it's time for your question to my next um, speaker. It also depends on the profile of your next speaker. Uh, I, have, uh, I would ask a bunch of questions. One of them, whether generative AI will kill digital twins, the classical digital twins, right? I really love this question because there is no answer actually to it. And uh, it allows actually yeah, simply to discuss, to moderate a, a bit here, yeah, and simply to provide kind of you know potential vision. Let's say yeah, what can happen uh, when we have generative AI uh, next generation? I would say yeah. Another question would be also uh, about ethic uh, uh, AI in general, right? And specifically in terms of generative AI, because the ethic topic is really huge. It's still uh, not well developed. We do need some constraints for sure. Uh, we do have an act, you know, yeah, from last week, and that was signed off uh, by many companies. Uh, but once again, it's still unclear which direction should be chosen. Yeah, whether we just, you know, limit and constrain everything, and it means also we uh, agree to compromise on the overall progress of AI, or we cleverly uh, regulate this market. Yeah. And then the question is, what does it mean to be clever yeah, or to be intelligent and somehow constrain it so that still it develops itself, right? I think it's an open question and allows uh, your next um, uh, partner to talk about this. Yeah, or at both, least I hope so. both perfect questions. Um, mm -hmm. I actually um, last week published the uh, video on ethical use of uh, uh, Gen AI. Uh, right. And uh, in the process, I learned that there's a new job called AI ethic assessor. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are people that do this professionally and get certified uh, on the AI ethics. Uh, we had an interesting discussion. Uh, I'm also planning to have a short interview with him, like a follow up, because EU just um, uh, accepted the new regulation for AI. Right. And Last it's, week. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic, uh, Mike. Um, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I appreciate your views on uh, oil and gas and on AI in general. And uh, I'm sure we'll um, stay in touch and uh, have more interviews uh, in the future. Thank you very much, Ilya. Thank you all, guys. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you have a story to share, please don't hesitate to uh, contact me. Uh, and um, um, have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.